Well, most of you know that Gail and I celebrated our 50th anniversary last uh, January, uh, and um, we're still trying to get to Hawaii. <laughs> and uh, so y'all pray for us that that'll happen. Uh, you know, we, we actually met in the cafeteria at Baptist Bible College back in 1970. And to be honest with you, we weren't really interested in each other when we met one another. I mean, it was just kind of like, hi, you know, yeah. And, uh, and, and so we, we just kind of, uh, it wasn't that love at first sight thing. And so um, uh, a couple of days later, a friend of mine challenged me to ask her out on a date. And, you know, I thought, well, no big deal, I'll do it. And then he says, but here is what you have to say. You've got to say, when you ask her on a date, you've got to say, hey, Gayla, baby, how about a date this weekend? And I said, well, I can do that. Now, I don't know what kind of stupidity hovered over me at that time, but I walked right straight up to her, looked her in the face, and I said, hey, Gayla, baby, how about a date this weekend? That's stupid. And with poise and dignity, she looked at me and she said, I'm busy right now, but if you would just go and sit down for a moment, I'll come over and we'll talk about this. <laughs> I felt stupid. And, and, and so I, I went and sat down at a table and I just waited there and I thought to myself, how stupid you got, oh man, maybe, maybe you need to leave. I, I mean, what is she going to do? And so she comes over again with like an angel kind of floating across the floor with poise and dignity, she sits down at my table and she says these words, first of all, I want to thank you for asking me out on a date. She said, um, however, uh, I have got to let you know that I already have a date for this weekend and so I'm going to have to say no. And I thought, Oh man, she's, she's going she's gonna to get me here. And then she said, however, I would be open for you to ask me on a date some other time at a later date. And I thought, oh man, this is going, this is really, and so I said, okay, <clears throat> how about next weekend? And she said, I'm sorry, I've got a date next weekend. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, she set me up here but I've got endurance. I'm going to be able to see this through. And so I said, well, how about the weekend after that? She said, well, that would be okay, except I've got a Tupperware party to go to. However, I'm available for the weekend after that. I had to put in a three-week reservations to get a date with her. <laughs> Valentine weekend, you know. But she, she intrigued me with, with her, her poise and, and, the, and the way she expressed herself. And I'm, I'm sitting there feeling like a dunce, like a fool, and here is this elegant g woman that is paying me attention, and I'm thinking, this, this, is, this is crazy. And so I'm drawn to her, and, but I can't do anything. You see, at, at Baptist Bible College, we were restricted from having one date a week. That was it. And, and, and so I've got to wait for three weeks. And, and we're passing each other in the hall, and she's kind of waving at me, and I'm thinking, and, and, and the more I would see her, the more beautiful she would become, and, and, and I'm, I'm just thinking, and I can't see her for three weeks. But there was a loophole in the rule. You could, you could go on kind of a group activity together, and a group activity was coming up at Springfield Lake, and so we went, and there were all of these college students, and, and so it didn't count, and we were able to just visit for a little bit. And again, she just impressed me with, 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 with her poise. He is proclaiming that the, universe, that the God of the universe stepped out of time and into the womb of Mary and hovered there for nine months and then was born into the world in human flesh. This is incomprehensible. This is why people have so, so much trouble with the deity of Christ. It is difficult for us to be able to grasp the magnitude of what God did through the birth of Christ. Unbelievable. Incomprehensible, as the song that we sang. So this is what Paul does. He starts out by just focusing on the person of Christ. And then he transitions to focus on his position. 
He, and, and as, as you look at the second part of the verse, that he says, firstborn over all creation. In the Hebrew culture, the firstborn of any family was the, was the acting priest. He, he was supposed to be the spiritual one. He got a double portion of the, uh, of the inheritance, and he probably was even the executor of the estate. And, and so, so it was the highest, highest position uh, there in the family. And, and what, he's, what he's saying here is that Christ has been positionally set over creation above all the kings of the earth. Uh, Psalm 89, 27 says, I will make him, Jesus, my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. In Revelation 1, uh, verse 5, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of all the kings of the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ has been designated the highest ruler over all creation, over all the kings, and what's going to happen as soon as we are raptured out of this place, go through the tribulation, and begin the, tribulation, uh, begin the millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years. This is his position. His person is God in the flesh. His position is the ruler of the universe and the king of glory. But he doesn't stop there. He focuses on his preexistence. Look down as we read. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in, on earth, visible and invisible, where there are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and is before all things, and in him all things were created. It's like an anthem. Here Paul includes Christ in the Genesis account of creation. Especially there in Genesis 1, 26, where, where, where God Almighty says, Let us make man in our own image. Uh, uh, he, is, he is included as, as, as co-creator. And so here we have, uh, uh, and, and that was one of the problems in the church there, is, is that some of the teachers were pulling away from the deity of Christ. Uh, in, in Colossians 2, as we'll read in a few weeks, he says, let no, uh, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility or the worship of angels. They were worshiping angels. Jesus is creator, king, and Christ, who is highly exalted above all things, all kings. And here's the thing. This highly exalted one is offering close fellowship with us. Come into my presence, fellowship, uh, be, be part of this knowledge of himself. And here's the thing, as we begin to understand that, as we begin to see who he is and his exalted position, and we, try, and we begin to see him, begins to transition us. We become keenly aware of his person. We, we, we understand his position. We know that he is the creator of the universe. And as we do that, we begin to be transported from this dark suppression of anxiety and stress that so many people are dealing with now and we begin to transport it into the security and the assurance of his presence suddenly he becomes the preeminent one in our life as we look at him as we see who he is and we begin to draw into his presence he becomes first place in our life as, and, and, and things begin to happen. When, when this begins to occur, things begin to happen. First of all, he becomes the focal point of our church. Look down in, in verse uh, 18. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church. We went through postmodernism in the 60s to, to about 2000. And what that period of time did is it created an existential Christian. What is existentialism? That means that, that I am the center of my universe. Everything extends from me. 
That's what existentialism is. And, and that's what we begin to go through back there in postmodernism. And we brought it into the church where now, you know, the church is, is, makes me the preeminent one. It coddles me. And so what happens is, is we, we as individuals become the focal point of, of our Christianity rather than Christ. That's what all the songs are out there. You know, he will he will serve us. He will do this for you. And suddenly we become focused on comfort and preferences and personalities and prosperity and programs. We're looking for all of these things in the church. We we, we become ca cafeteria Christians where we go over here a little bit and a little that we don't like this. Oh, we like that, but we don't like this. We don't like this. And and pretty soon everything is about us. It's it's not about Christ. We look at we look at God. At celestial Santa Claus, that we can just look up and say, what are you going to give me today? What's in it for me? What are you going to do for me today, God? And we focus on ourselves and instead of this one that, that the song is, is about here. Alexander uh, Solotson was asked this question. How did, I didn't say his name right. I know I didn't. I'm not Russian. How did the West decline from its triumphal march to its present sickness. He answered with one word, anthropocentric, anthropocentric, self-focus. You see, here's the thing. When we begin to understand Christ as creator and Christ and coming king and the head of the church, we will extend instinctively begin to transition and move from self-service to sacrificial service. It will be part of our nature. We'll see him differently and we'll move his direction. So so as as we as we begin to see him as who he is, drawing close to him, immersing ourselves in this epinosis, understanding him, he becomes the focal point of the church. But he also becomes the focal point during crisis. All of us are going to suffer. And, and here in, uh, over in Colossians 18b, there it says, Who is, talking about Jesus, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? We immerse ourselves into the epinosis, knowledge of Christ. We become cognizant of his death and his resurrection. We've been studying in Sunday school class this morning. And as we begin to analyze Christ's death and burial and resurrection, we begin to internalize that in our own lives and the water of crisis that we're going through, and suddenly it gives us hope. You say, how is that? Well, going back over to Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, Paul writes this. He says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, most of us take that as a salvific passage of Scripture. We're, we're looking at that passage of Scripture as being, you know, saved so we can go to heaven. But when I read this, I see it completely different. I, I, when I see Christ for who He is, and I recognize that He has raised Himself from the dead, then I'm thinking, if Christ could raise himself from the dead, he can surely lift me out of whatever little crisis or circumstance that I'm going through right now. Do you get that? It's the power of the resurrection. As, uh, and, and, uh, and, and we see that. So, so immersing ourselves in his will, wisdom, and understanding of Christ doesn't prevent the crisis. It just allows us to have security as we go through it and pick up the maturity on the way through. So, so he becomes the focal point of our church. He becomes the focal point during crisis, and then he becomes the focal point in our culture. That in all things he may have preeminence. In all things that he may have the preeminence. This word preeminence is proteo in the Greek, and, and it, it really means highest rank, first place, highest priority. And, you know, it's only used twice in the New Testament. Here, we talk about the preeminence of Christ, that he might have all preeminence, and in, in 3 John, verse 9. I want you to look at this. Paul 
says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Diotrephes wanted the preeminence, wanted the glory, wanted that highest rank. And, and so the question is, for each one of us to ask, who has or what has the highest priority in our life? Am I the highest priority in my life? Is money the highest priority in my life? What, what, is, is, uh, uh, is power, is position the highest priority in my life? If I make Christ the highest priority in my life, the number one in my life, but myself down to number four or five, then all of a sudden it begins to change my culture. Everything around me begins to change. Our guys are meeting, uh, Ken has gotten our guys to meet on Thursday morning over at Denny's uh, for breakfast and it's, it's become a, a joy. We're just, we're talking about mentoring, we're, we're talking about accountability and, and uh, so you're invited, you guys, you're invited to come. Gotta pay, it's, 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 you gotta go Dutch, okay? But, uh, um, about three weeks ago, our waitress came to our table, and uh, we followed, uh, we just asked her, we're going to pray here in a minute, is there anything that we can pray for you about? And she said, yes, my mother passed away uh, uh, during COVID, and I would like for you to pray. And so we prayed for her. And, and so here, uh, we're all there again, we're, we're having good fellowship and fun, we're going to order, and the order comes. And I look over, I'm sitting where I can look at her, and she's hovering. Uh, she's back there. She, is everything okay? And, and there, but there's, there's something there, you know. And, and I said, Cheyenne, can we pray for you about anything? Is there anything that we can pray for you about? And she just scooted really quick over there and stood between my, myself and Dick, and she said, yes. She said, I'm having so much trouble uh, executing uh, my, my mom's estate. She said, I, I'm having trouble from the brothers and the sisters and I can't get the death certificates and I just, and she began explaining all the things that, that she was, straight, as if the death of her mom during COVID wasn't enough. Now it's all of these things that are going on and she's struggling with it. And I said, well, let's pray. And I'm telling you, she ran over there and she just grabbed me by, I didn't expect it. She grabbed me by the hand, was holding my, my hand as we prayed for her. It just changed the whole atmosphere of that part of the restaurant and she wept as we prayed for her because what we were doing is we you know we we're trying to make Christ the preeminent person in our life during that time not our breakfast not our fellowship but 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 he's he's prodding us and we surround Cheyenne and pray for her there are probably more to that story to come when we begin giving Christ the preeminence in our day-to-day -day routine and everything, it begins to change our culture. Uh, moves us back to, to where Christ is first in our life, where we're thinking about him, where we're looking to him for our power and for our prodding. And every time we do it, Satan will try to throw distractions in our way. He'll try to discourage us, tempt us, and, and he'll do everything he can, can to Pull our attention away and get us focused on something else when we got to focus back upon the preeminence of Christ. I read a story this week kind of goes like this. There was a guy who's, um, who couldn't feed his family because uh, no money, just, just out, of, out of food. And so he decided what he would do. He had an old gun in the house and he had three bullets. He decided he'd go and, and hunt some game and, um, uh, and, and, and try to bring some food home for his family. So, so, he, so he gets ready, gets his stuff, and he, and he goes out. And, and just a, a few miles down the road, he jumps up a rabbit. And he takes quick aim at the rabbit and pulls the trigger and misses. And the rabbit scurries off in the brush. So he goes a little farther, and he sees a squirrel shimmy up a tree. So he takes aim and he shoots at the squirrel and misses, and the squirrel gets in the hole of an old cottonwood tree. He got one shell left. And he's walking along, 
and he notices in front of him a turkey tom that is just perched in a tree and he's and he just freezes and and he hears a voice deep down inside of him that says pray aim high focus so he lifts his gun and he points at the turkey and then all of a sudden out of his peripheral vision he notices a doe over to the left and so it's a better shot a better kill and so he moves his gun and takes aim and he hears that voice deep down inside pray aim high focus about that time he notices something that's uh, that's getting his uh, kind of distracting him in front of him and he looks down and there's a rattlesnake that's coiled and it's got his, his, his mouth open and he's just following him and he's about ready to strike. And so he lowers the gun toward the rattlesnake and the voice repeats, pray, aim high, focus. So he lifts the gun back up toward the turkey, his original target, and, and he pulls the trigger. And the bullet goes out and goes through the turkey dropping the turkey from the tree, hits the tree, bounces over into the heart of the deer, dropping the deer. And the old gun, the impact was so, uh, so traumatic that the, that the old gun, the stock broke off, and about the time the snake was about to strike, he strikes the, the stock and it falls down and hits him in the head and kills the snake. The impact, the compression of the gun was so strong that it knocked him backwards into the pond and, and uh, he went under and, and when he comes back up he looks and all of his pockets are full of fish. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> Obstacles are what you see when you lose sight of Christ. Stay focused on Christ. The problem is an opportunity. Pray. Aim high. Stay focused. Upon your close, intimate, experiential knowledge of Christ. Trust Him to lift you out of the crisis. Trust Him to carry you through the crisis. This morning you may be a believer that has drifted. You may find yourself far from Christ emotionally, relationally. Maybe you're distracted. Maybe you're on the beginning of that. Maybe you're on the end of that. I want to encourage you. Jesus is just waiting for you to turn to him and make him number one. Not you being number one. Make him number one priority, preeminent in your life. Let's bow our heads. You know, every one of us struggle here, as I said before. And what we have to do is we have to look at him as our solid rock. He is the one. And so I don't think of a better song to sing than my hope is built on Jesus' blood, on, on his righteousness. And so I'm going to pray, and we're going to stand, and we're going to end with this song today, the solid rock. Lord in heaven, thank you for this passage of scripture, look at you, the Christ, the creator, the preeminent one, help us to see who you are, and Lord, whether we're walking through there's a temptation, well, whether, we're, whether we're struggling with our own pride, whatever it is, Lord, whatever distraction that Satan has thrown out there, help us to stop, to pray, to aim high, to focus upon you. You are our corner. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand. Thanks.